Well, let's get this trading week started. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Equity futures slightly positive. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Perro. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue, a synchronized mess for global markets. The headwinds are just very strong. The energy crisis. China's lockdowns, the complete lockdowns. Earnings estimates, growth estimates. Global tightening. A weaker global growth. The global slowdown. This is not good. Oh my God, it's a nightmare. The global pressures maintain a huge overhang over risk assets. There still seems to me plenty of room for the US to really push earnings down. It's gonna be much harder to identify a viable bottom. The combination of events is certainly going to be depressing. The volatility of markets. We're buckling up. We're gonna see a lot of volatility. It's gonna be really hard. There's no easy way to put this. Joining us now to discuss is Morgan Stanley's Jim Karen, Nuveen's Brian Nick. Brian, straight to you. Everyone's bearish. Is that a good enough reason to be bullish? Well, usually is a good reason to be bullish. Uh, certainly individual investors are still registering as quite bearish on the sort of uh, bullish bearish uh, spectrum. Uh, I think there are those concerns in the, in the clips you showed are all valid. Uh, a slower China energy crisis in Europe. I think the one thing that didn't probably get mentioned enough is, is the fact that the U.S. seems to be headed toward I think what passes for a, a best case scenario here, where it's maybe it's not quite a, a, a you know complete immaculate disinflation where things magically improve, but I think we are seeing signs that hiring managers, consumers are going to carry the U.S. economy through. And if you'd want one economy globally to still be chugging along at this point, you'd want to pick the U.S. We caught up with Rick Reader of BlackRock last Friday after the payrolls report. Jim Karen, he's betting that we can get a soft landing, except he's not actually betting on that with his money right now. He's still holding cash. Jim, do you think we can get a soft landing, but is it too early to express that in this market just now? So I'll say that it's certainly possible. That's within the realm of possibilities. Um, it's seeming less and less likely, though, as time goes on, especially with what's going on in Europe and energy problems and things like that. Inflation is very, very high. But look, it could be the case that uh, that the Fed is hiking interest rates. Inflation will come down and, and that we do get a soft landing. Now, the idea behind a soft landing is to say that we don't have a, a deep recession. So it's debatable whether we're in a recession right now or, or not, two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Growth, but obviously jobs aren't uh, aren't consistent with that. The jobs market's still very, very strong. So I think a hard landing or a recession scenario really comes when the unemployment rate really starts to spike a lot higher. So I, I, I think the I think we can think about uh, having a soft landing, but I think it becomes a, a very, very hard bet to place. And the markets aren't necessarily calling for that if, if I look at the Fed funds, market, uh, Fed funds futures market either. We've still got to consider weaker earnings as well. Mike Wilson, your colleague over at Morgan Stanley Chip, said this this morning. We think the next several quarters will end up containing some of the most significant downward revisions to forward EPS forecasts we have seen in the past several cycles. Jim, how bad is the earnings story going to be through the next couple of quarters? <laughs> So, so, so I, th I think it's a good question. I mean, you know, clearly inflation has propped up earnings, and now as inflation starts to come down, it's going to slow earnings. And this is part of Mike Wilson's fire and ice. Fire is that the Fed hikes interest rates and it slows and, and it hurts the stock market. Ice is when you have a slow earnings growth, uh, you know, period. So I, I, I do think that over the next uh, period of time, over the next quarter or so, we're probably going to see uh, a downward adjustment in, in forward expected earnings. Um, you know, but the idea behind the whole thing, though, is that Mike Wilson's also calling for the fact that we probably bought them in the equity markets sometime in the fourth quarter and that if we have a recession maybe the bottom's not quite in but you know but 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 we're close to it so effectively what we're really saying is that we are at a turning point that the that the data as far as the earnings are concerned from, from corporations are starting to catch up now with the economic fundamentals especially as inflation starts to come down so look i mean i, I don't think it's going to be an easy road ahead but I think it is going to be somewhat bumpy, and I think there's going to be some opportunities to find some, um, you know, some, some good assets to invest in that maybe have already priced this in. Well, Mike's at 3,400 in Q4 as a low at a minimum. That if we get a recession, it could go as low as 3,000 on the S&P 500. Brian, hasn't the chairman of the Fed just told us the rules of the game 
that even if we say evidence of, say, a Goldilocks jobs report, that's not something you can buy, not something you can expect a durable rally from because they want to keep financial conditions tight, tight, tight. Isn't that just the rule to the game now through year end? Absolutely. I mean, we're writing our fourth quarter outlook right now. And one of our themes from the last quarter was it's all about the Fed. And I think we're going to keep that theme in place and say it's still all about the Fed because all these market movements are being seen through the prism of how central banks, not just the Fed, all central banks are going to respond. So that really good jobs report, what I thought was sort of a Goldilocks type report on Friday, doesn't get cheered the same way that it would if it wasn't being seen as maybe giving the Fed some reason to continue hiking at 75 basis points or to hike to a higher terminal rate. But I still think this comes down to consumers. Unless and until we see the consumer roll over, either because the job market gets incrementally or significantly weaker in the next couple of months, or because confidence just sort of falls through the floor because maybe we get another spike in, say, energy prices. Unless and until we see that, you know, real incomes have turned positive again. We, you know, if you look at the, the U.S. consumers, sort of the economic scenario they're facing, the spike that we got in commodity prices and the 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 drop in real incomes has already happened and they kind of sustained growth through that period. So if we start to see, again, tame commodity prices here in the US combined with rising incomes and rising employment, that's, again, exactly the scenario you'd want to see if you thought we had any chance at a soft landing here. Futures right now positive a half of 1% on the S&P 500, going into the opening bell about 25 minutes away. Equity futures on the NASDAQ up a half of 1% also. ECB rate decision this Thursday. And whilst the news conference is going on, you're going to hear from the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Chairman Powell, Mike McKee, who scheduled that one this <laughs> Thursday? That's a good question, John. And another question we're asking ourselves this morning is, why did we bother to come back from the summer after Labor Day in the United States? Because there's a whole lot of problems out there that you've got to factor into your trading, uh, one of which is recession in Europe, the UK cost of living crisis, of course. UK and EU power crisis not getting a lot of attention, but it does get the sobriquet Lehman moment because there are margin calls on energy companies they may not be able to meet. OPEC. Did, is cutting its supply, didn't raise its supply, so maybe oil prices go back up, haven't yet. And then, of course, the always present China COVID zero overhang. So we go into the week with a lot to watch. Uh, Liz Truss, Her Majesty, has blessed her prime ministership, so now we got to watch what she does to try to bail out the United Kingdom. And then today we get ISM services and the S&P services, the PMI's services and uh, composite. Uh, the Royal Bank of Australia raised 50 this morning. Uh, Royal Bank, the Reserve Bank of Australia raised 50 this morning. The Bank of Canada expected in an hour to do 75. Wednesday, we get the trade balance here. And, of course, the dollar and trade, very important around the world. Uh, the beige book is coming out. And as you uh, had a picture of all those Fed people speaking, Barkin, Mester, Brainerd, and Barr. And then on Thursday, Powell at the same time as Christine Lagarde. We're going to have to figure out which one goes on Bloomberg television. Jobless claims, eh. Uh, Friday, Evans, Waller, and George, and then the Eurozone energy ministers meet to try to deal with that Lehman moment question. So a lot of news that's going to flow across your Bloomberg today. Uh, the ECB is going to be the biggest thing of all, of course, and that is Thursday, and we will be watching to see what they do right now. Uh, the OIS markets are pricing just under a 75 basis 75. point move. They're leaning in that direction. And the markets are already asking, do they do another 75 after this? And this has changed not just in the last six months. I'd say this has changed in the last six weeks, the last two weeks, the last one week. Mike McKee, the ECB changed its timing of the news conference to accommodate U.S. data, and the chairman has put an address right in the middle of it. I'm not sure what I make of that. Mike McKee, thank you very much, sir. Jim Karen, you're calling this the RIP cycle. Now, that's enough to make me run a mile, yet at the same time you're saying there's opportunities out there. What are the opportunities out there in the so-called RIP cycle? So, so the RIP cycle is re recession, inflation, and policy risks. And clearly, central banks are on uh, on high speed to, to control inflation. And if we have recession risks that are out there, the, the response to control inflation is higher rates. But if you're worried about recession, you might need to lower rates. So therefore, the policies are at odds with each other. So it's really a question of time frame. I think that over the near term, what the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England, and, and every other, almost every other central bank is going to try to do is contain inflation risks and bring those inflation risks a lot lower. In that interim period of time, I think that there are going to be there is going to be some volatility in the markets. But we also have to remember what the end game is. The end game is that after this episode it has passed, passed, let's say over the next 
quarter or so, then what we're likely to see is a lower period of, of inflation. And then many assets, whether it's fixed income or even equity, start to actually look like they have some value. But in the interim period, it's very, very near term. So the way that I would think about it is that if we are having a slowdown, then it's likely that when we have a recession, if we have a recession, it's a mild recession, which means default risks are going to be low. So if interest rates rise, which they're doing, then high yield, investment grade, mortgage-backed securities, all of these bonds start to look like very, very interesting investment opportunities as long as we believe that default risks are going to stay low because if we have a slowdown, it's mild or it's a recession and it's mild. And yeah. this is going to represent a great buying opportunity. So this is the way that we have to think about it across these time frames. Uh, Jim, is 326 on a 10-year a good buying opportunity? So, I, I mean, I, I think that the 10-year could probably get as high as 350 to 360. That's roughly the highs of the year. So maybe the highs of the year are already in. So as long as you have some room to, to, to give the 10-year yield to maybe sell off a little bit more, I think that's a, I think it's a decent buying opportunity. I think it's going to be hard for 10-year Treasury yields to get much higher than that unless we have a really strong economic rebound and we have significant inflation going forward, which – could push yields higher. But right now, that's not in our expectations. We do expect there to be a rolling over of the economy and also a containment of these inflation risks over the next few quarters. So I think 3.5% in the 10-year yield is about where we think it could go. So if you're willing to be a little bit early, then maybe 325 could be an okay spot to start to add some duration. Climbing a big time this morning, up seven basis points on the 10-year to 326, and raising a move lower in Friday's session at the front end, up nine basis points on a two-year to about 348. Jim Kerr and Brian Nick sticking with us. Counting you down to the open and bow. Let's get you some stocks on the move ahead of that open. Here's Abby. Hey, John. Well, also climbing, at least in terms of price stocks themselves. After three down weeks, we do have the S&P 500 futures higher, helping out in a big way, big tech. Apple leading the charge up about six tenths of 1%. Even with yields higher on the morning, big tech not really falling on this ahead of uh, also Apple's big iPhone event tomorrow, product unveil event to see that iPhone 14 plus other products. ADT soaring up 16%, a 1.2 billion dollar investment from State Farm at nine dollars per share in the security company. Google's also reported to have invested uh, in the company. CVS Health up one percent after buying Signify Health for eight billion dollars. This had been rumored. Now it's official. And of course, the company moving more and more away from uh, retail into other health businesses. Signify, of course, is a home services tech company. And then finally, Bed Bath & Beyond shares declining sharply. This, of course, after the recent death of the company's former CFO, uh, the path forward becoming a a little bit less clear, John. Incredibly tragic story. Abby, thank you. Coming up, European officials racing to address the deepening energy crisis. We need to be prepared for a total cut of gas supply from Russia. And we have been preparing that kind of a decision. That conversation, I'm next. It's not a surprise. Nobody uh, should be surprised by uh, this very last decision of the Russian government. We need to be prepared for a total cut of gas supply from Russia. Europe scrambling to address the deepening energy crisis with Russia closing off its main pipeline to the continent. Energy ministers meeting Friday to discuss possible market interventions as government officials continue planning their own relief measures. The UK Prime Minister Liz Truss putting together a £170 billion fiscal support package. I will deliver on the energy crisis, dealing with people's energy bills, but also dealing with the long-term issues we have on energy supply. One of the best joining us out of London now, Bloomberg's Will Kennedy. Will, let's go there. The proposal, what we've seen in the reports, 130 billion to freeze energy prices for consumers and then something like 40 billion for UK businesses. Will, what are they trying to achieve here and what do you make of this plan? 
Well, it's an enormous plan. Those numbers, if they come to pass, would represent something like about 5% of GDP. Um, so to spend that in a very period of 18 months is a pretty extraordinary intervention that rivals and maybe in, even surpasses what was done uh, during the pandemic. So it's a bazooka solution. What they're trying to do is basically freeze prices, remove the pain for households. It would cap prices where they are now. So it would mean that people aren't exposed to the massive rises we've seen in wholesale prices over recent months. Um, and it would take the political sting out of those uh, proposed rises. And it would... Uh, put a cap on inflation too. Does but it do at the expense, anything clearly to of... address demand? Sorry? The issue that you've brought up is whether it does anything to address demand. And looking at the well, Europeans, the downs... we're waiting for that next phase. Yeah, that's the downside, of course. I mean, one way you address this energy crisis, which is basically about a shortage of energy, is to constrain demand. And we've seen the market doing that. We've seen industrial users in the UK and the EU, people like metal smelters, fertilizer factories shut down because they can't afford it. But of course, if you're just going to subsidize prices for consumers, they won't be turning off their tumble dryers. They won't be using their dishwashers less often. They won't be, importantly, turning down their thermostats. Now, that's good for consumers on one level, but clearly it does nothing to balance the market. And that means that ultimately it might make some form of rationing more likely. Will Kennedy out of London. Will, we're going to catch up with you through the week, hopefully, to get the update on this as we look for more details of that plan from Liz Truss. Will, thank you. The plan so far, £170 billion. Pounds. And as Will Kennedy pointed out, that's about 5% of GDP. And a question we've been asking repeatedly over the last week is how wide open this bond market is to finance that. Now, clearly, when we had a massive fiscal effort back in the pandemic, we had low inflation, we had rate cuts and QE. And this time around, the backdrop is very, very different. Fiscal authorities and monetary policy authorities aren't complementing each other. They're in conflict. So we have the big fiscal effort on the horizon. We don't have QE, we have QT. We don't have rate cuts, we have rate hikes. And we don't have low inflation, you all know that. We have high inflation. So, Jim Caron, it makes me wonder, ask the question, how expensive is it going to be to finance a big effort like the one we're discussing in the UK right now? So you're asking the right question. It's a question of cost. And th this really accentuates what I call that RIP cycle here. It's just another element of it. So it's really a question of control and the cost. So Europe and other countries say we're going to have a price cap on energy. Conveniently, there's, a, there's an oil leak in, the, in, in Nord Stream 1. And what Putin says is, well, if you're going to have a price cap, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the cost of that price cap extremely high by limiting these supplies. Now, I don't know anything. I'm just looking at the, the, the facts, and I'm just trying to put things together here. So then it becomes a question of what is that cost to economies very, very broadly? And then how does that impact their balance sheets, so terms of trade and, and, and other things of, of that nature? And then ultimately, how does it impact GDP and growth and then to your point, John, is how does all of this get paid for? And this becomes a financing issue. And maybe we're going to see the immediate cost in this in terms of higher bond yields, higher interest rates. And this is obviously going to weigh on economic activity. Higher rates discount future uh, cash flows. That lowers the present value of the assets. That brings asset prices down. So it's really a question of how do we control this situation with energy, Russia, and what have you, and what is the actual cost for that? And we have to think about it along those lines. And as you, as you point out, how do we pay for it? Bond yields. Higher yields, a weaker currency, that's Higher what we've yields. seen. We've just had the biggest monthly pop in two-year gilt yields on record. And we've also had, at the same time, the worst month for sterling going all the way back to late 2016. Brian, when you look at policy in conflict like it is in Europe at the moment, what do you think the consequences of that will be? I think cost, uh, which you guys have been talking about, is definitely one angle. I think effectiveness also matters, too. If you have the fiscal authorities that are trying to loosen things up, trying to encourage consumers to spend, not just on energy, but giving them enough money to spend on all the goods and services that they typically buy, but at the same time, you have central banks that are aggressively raising interest rates to basically try to stop that exact kind of spending, these two things are not going to be as effective as they would if you were doing them in isolation or if they were synchronous like they were for most of the last two and a half years when everybody was just easing like mad. So I, I think that the, the problem here is going to be on the one hand, you have some part of the government trying to support the consumer and businesses and another part of the government trying to push them down. And you might end up with neither policy being terribly effective, which is, again, is not going to be great for for revenues, for earnings. Um, I don't know about the direction of interest rates, because on the one hand, if you have a slower economy, the longer term interest rate should be going down. But right now you have very high inflation expectations in the UK and in Europe that I think are keeping those bond yields 
higher because there's concerns about just how long this is going to go on. Right on cue, the 10-year guilt yield through 3% for the first time since 2014. As some people forecasting, there's more upside here for yields in the UK and across Europe and more downside for the currencies. Jim Karen, when you look across the central banks right now, it's not just the Fed in 75. Catherine Mann of the MPC over at the Bank of England delivered a speech in the last 24 hours, talking up front-loading again, going big possibly. So we're talking about the potential of 75 at the Fed, 75 at the Bank of England, 75 at the ECB. And Jim, maybe the more important question right now is whether we start having a conversation about who leads the cuts here first, the ECB, the Fed or the Bank of England? So I think there are three questions. How much, how high, and for how long? How much are central banks going to hike rates over the very, very near term? I think they need to be aggressive. I think that, 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 that talking along these lines for right now is probably the right thing. But it's always a question of what is the terminal rate? How high are they going to, how high are they actually going to go? And then secondarily, how long are they actually going to stay there? And what I think is going to happen is the way central banks have typically operated in the past is they tend to hike interest rates until something breaks. Because you can hike rates and if, if you're still getting inflation, if you're still getting high rate, if you're still getting high prices, and what have you, they're going to keep going until you get a material economic slowdown, a hard landing, or possibly a recession. That's what the futures markets are actually pricing in right now. People talk about a Fed pivot or a pivoting of central banks. Yeah. That's really not what the futures markets are saying. What they're saying is that the more these central banks hike, the higher, the fatter the tail is that we get some type of an economic accident and something breaks and they have to cut rates very, very quickly at some point in the future. I would argue it's the U.S. Hey, Jim, this was great. Jim Karen, Brian Nick, great to catch up. Terrible stories sometime. And think about this, we're just talking about one winter. That's what we're framing out right now. Relief for one winter. What about if we have to do this again? Coming up, the morning calls and later, RBC's Amy Will Silverman bracing for a volatile few months still ahead. She joins us around the opening bell. away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning. Just about holding on to these gains here, up four tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, up a quarter of one percent. That's the price action. Here's your morning calls. First up, City downgrading FedEx to neutral, 225 price target, expecting macro headwinds to continue pressuring the company's earnings growth potential. Your second call from Wolf Research, upgrading Tesla to outperform, 360 price target, saying benefits from the Inflation Reduction Act could boost shares by as much as 30 percent. Now, stocks up a half of 1%. And finally, JP Morgan downgrading Discover Financial to neutral, taking a more cautious view on US consumer finance stocks amid numerous uncertainties. Just a moment around the opening bell. You're going to hear from the Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky delivering remarks prior to the opening bell on the New York Stock Exchange. I believe we can catch up with AMH down in DC to guide us into that. Amory, what are we expecting here? Well, Jonathan, over the weekend, he spoke to Ursula von der Leyen of the European Union, and what likely he's going to be doing is making sure that he is still sounding the alarm, that even though potentially it's still not front-page news every single day in the United States, there is an active war in Ukraine, and this is a country that is asking for more money. And, of course, now we have the Senate back in session today, where the top priority is going to be being able to fund the government through October 1st, and one item that the White House is asking the the Senate and Congress to pass forward is more aid to Ukraine the, to the tune of $11.7 billion. Some of this would go to equipment going directly to Ukraine. Others' uh, monies would go towards the Pentagon replenishing their stock, intelligence, et cetera. Also, $2 billion earmarked, the White House is asking for, on potentially helping the U.S. energy sector as we are going to see those prices rise. It's not going to be the similar situation like they're dealing in Europe, where it's very, very challenging. But at the same time, they are looking down at this winter and how this war is impacting those energy costs. And Zelensky is going to want to remind Americans that please continue to stand with us, even though it may hurt your own economies. And Marie, it's not just the United States, it's the Europeans as well. You've seen some of these numbers. They are huge. Big, big numbers in Europe to offset some of this energy pain. Can he keep the support of the Europeans on side as well? I believe we can take a listen to President Zelensky right now. 
we stand so that every Ukrainian would enjoy all the manifestations of freedom available to a free person in a democratic society. We have achieved significant results. We have united the whole world around our struggle for freedom. We are liberating Ukrainian territory from the Russian army. We have already started renovated everything that was destroyed by the Russian terror. We are rebuilding our economy. We are giving you and your companies the opportunity to work together with us for the benefit of all us. Ukraine is the story of a future victory and a chance for you to invest now in projects worth of hundreds of billions of dollars to share the victory with us. Today, we kickstart a large-scale promotion campaign to attract investments. Advantage Ukraine. We will tell the world why Ukraine is a place for good investments and financial opportunities. I invite you to Ukraine. Invest in Ukraine. This will be your victory and a new success story for, for your companies. Slava Ukraini. Start your work. That's the opening bell live in New York City this morning. Good morning. That was President Zelensky rigging the opening bell virtually for the New York Stock Exchange from Ukraine. We'll catch up with Amory Hordern a little bit later again in the program. About a few seconds into this, going into the opening bell, futures positive a quarter of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, up around about a tenth. The story fades in the equity market. If you get to the bond market, we look a little something like this. Yields higher through much of this morning on a 10-year by nine basis points, a 10-year 327.86 in the FX market, breaking down again on euro dollar, 98 98, we're down a third of 1%, and crude higher by a dollar, one percentage point higher, 87, 85 on crude. Let's get you some of the stocks around the open. Here's Abby. John, well, we are off the pre-market highs for stocks, but we do have some stocks solidly higher, including Apple. This, of course, ahead of the company's annual product event tomorrow. Of course, that iPhone 14 will be revealed, among other products. Investors and folks wondering what the new iPods will look like. Tesla up about nine-tenths of 1%, getting a nice upgrade from Wolf to outperform. Ahead of, according to the analyst, uh, the reason for this bullishness, the new EV tax credits that are coming. UAL or United Airlines higher up 2%. This, of course, getting uh, the overall sector getting a lift from Europe. Lufthansa avoided a strike, and uh, United does, of course, have a JV partnership with uh, Lufthansa. And then finally, yields higher, as you were mentioning, that's helping out the banks. Wells Fargo is one of those banks, up about nine tenths of 1%, John. Abby, thank you. Around the up and pound, then we are positive on the SP 500, just about a four tenths of 1%. The NASDAQ up by about a quarter of 1% as well. So slightly firmer around the open this Tuesday morning with a little bit more. Here's Taylor Riggs. Hey, Taylor. We're going to do some fundamentals and some other non-fundamentals, John. When we think about some of the meme stocks in this, that meme ETF, as you can see, really a big decline when you think about sort of the peak trading and some of the peak highs for a lot of these companies. AMC, GameStop, a few that we're taking a look at on that intraday basis that are declining just a little bit, particularly for GameStop as we get into some of those quarterly results tomorrow. Uh, change up the board. Let's take a look at this terminal chart, John, because one way instead of buying the outright stock, we know, of course, that there's been a lot of activity within the options market. This chart, though, shows that there's some of the fewest trading of calls uh, that you've seen since a lot of the meme mania began back in about December of 2020 and January of 2021. So you're looking at some lighter trading volume as we head into this. Uh, note my language. I mentioned the GameStop quarterly results, not the earnings, because there are no earnings. They're still facing some significant losses on the bottom line as we get some of those reports tomorrow. Uh, but this shows sort of the 10% in either direction implied moves that you sort of get after the reaction to those results. So maybe some future volatility ahead. Taylor, more vault account. Amy Will Silverman of RBC on board with that. We're going to catch up with her in just a moment. Tallback as Michael Purvis had this to say, the PEs and equity risk premia are more attractive than they were in the middle of August. It might be enough to keep aggressive and persistent selling. We think this also means a lot of cross-asset volatility, which is coming right on cue for the historically most volatile month 
of the year. Kelly Lines has more. Hi, Kelly. Hey, John. Not just the most volatile, but also historically the worst in terms of performance for the S&P 500 September since the year 2000, on average bringing a decline of about 1.3% for this equity market. So will that hold true again in this month in 2022 and maybe more importantly for the rest of the year? Because if you're looking at the bear case, there's a number of things to point to potentially, including from Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley warning on earnings downgrades today, saying the S&P could fall as low as 3,000 in the case of a recession. Session. And you also have a bear case potentially in that the Federal Reserve would maybe like to see equities continue to decline as they try to tighten policy. The researchers over at Luthold Group uh, showing that basically a 19% drop in the S&P 500 is usually a prerequisite for getting inflation under control, considering so much of American money is in uh, at home in the equity market. And of course, as the Fed tightened policy, that brings rates higher. And we know that affects interest rate sensitive high multiple stocks uh, in particular. We had a nice rally in the NASDAQ 100 from mid-June until mid-August as we saw rates moving lower, yields moving lower. But now that yields are back up more than 60 basis points, uh, since August began, we've seen the NASDAQ 100 rolling over as well. It's information technology, communication services, consumer discretionary, all those tech heavy sectors have posted the biggest losses since that rally peaked uh, mid last month. In fact, pretty much every major industry group is down since then. The one exception being energy, which of course is a whole lot cheaper, John. Kelly Lines. Thank you. The breakdown of today's session, Kelly doing a brilliant job of just breaking things down more broadly for today. About four or five minutes into it, we're advancing about a quarter of 1%. Utilities top of the pile, up eight-tenths of 1%. Communication services, bottom of the pile, down around about a third of 1%. You've all heard the bearish speak, I know. This from Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley. Here's another quote from him. We think the lows for this bear market will likely arrive in the fourth quarter with 3,400 the minimum downside right now 39.33 he thinks if we get a recession we could go as low as 3k he says our leading models point to continued and increasingly significant eps growth downside well into 2023 he cut his earnings forecast a little bit earlier this morning we shared some of that with you so just one of many many bears out there at the moment here's one bull it's ben laidler of etoro take a listen Inflation fever, I think, is is beginning to is beginning to break. The U.S. economy is actually reaccelerating right now. Right, it's not about to sort of plunge on in, into recession. We're having healthy right. jobs reports. We've got gasoline prices coming down. The consumer is going to end up with more money uh, in uh, in in their pocket. This is a market which or uh, which is talking itself into into a funk. RBC Capitals, Amy Wu Silverman joins us right now for more. Amy, love catching up with you. You're strongly convicted there's more volatility ahead. Why is that? Well, several reasons, John. You know, one you guys pointed to earlier, which is historically and seasonally, September and October tend to be the most volatile times if you look to the past decade of how VIX rises. But on top of that, it's been very interesting because the options market has been exhibiting very low skew, meaning there hasn't been this desire to hedge. And one thing that concerns me is if there is that mad scramble to hedge, if you start to see more downside, then people are going to have to pile in very quickly and that can tend to exacerbate certain moves, especially volatility. Amy, I was going through your notes and one thing you provide is advice for anyone sitting on any gains they've got left from the June rally, the bear market rally, labelled that way by many. What is your suggestion? What's your advice? Yeah, look, you know, it's interesting on an individual stock basis, things are exhibiting something quite similar to the macro level. But look, if you've had kind of stocks up 25, 30 percent since mid-June and you think as we head into the year, there's going to be more downside catalysts, I think overriding actually makes sense right now on an overall basis. You know, limited upside. What do you do to collect yield, attractive yield at this point as we head into the end of the year? I think that's something that makes sense. One line that caught my attention was this correlated moves down. When you get them, it pays to earn the cheapest volatility. Amy, what did you mean by that? And what exactly is a trade there? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, one thing I look at that when we talk about tails in the market, obviously what's going on in Europe right now, as we head into, into, into winter with what's going on with Russia, uh, you, you know, a lot of people say, look, U.S. looks attractive versus Europe. However, one thing to keep in mind is when things go down, the first move always tends to be this correlated move down. So often people are sitting there thinking about ways to head Europe and 
the actuality is, John, the best hedge is often the one that's simply the cheapest vol because we'll get that correlated move down. So maybe you would rather be an S&P or IWM, even though they seem to be more defensive. But again, on that first tactical move, they all move the same way. Everyone on here, Amy, and just to build on this, is super bearish. Are you saying what they're doing is slightly different when you look at downside protection and the price of it here stateside? Yeah, here's what I would say. I think that when you look to things that will drive volatility, right now short-term volatility is floating higher than long-term because particularly in September and October, there, there are a lot of events. There's conference season, there's FOMC. And what I think is interesting is that there really isn't that demand for hedges yet. But I think as we get new information, everything's become very data-driven. People have been playing it very short-term. And a consequence of that, John, is you're not going to see how concerned people are, how they truly are, until it's sort of only a few days before because of what's happened with the path of the S&P year to date. You know, their hedges have not been working out. You've actually been better off selling puts. So the reality is you're not going to see how concerned people are until kind of one or two days before the event. It's going to be very short term. So short dated that capture specific catalysts. Is that the advice here, right? Yes, even if that volatility is a little inflated compared to longer term volatilities. Amy with Silverman. Amy, you're one of the best. We always enjoy catching up with you. It's been too long. Come back soon. Amy, joining us from RBC. Just noticed the 10 year through 330, looking at 331. This is a real pop higher in 10 year yields, up 12 basis points. High of the year, back in the middle of the year, intraday out of 10 year, just short of 350, 349.65. Right now, just short of 331. That's some turnaround. We breached 331 very briefly just moments ago. So up 11 or 12 basis points on a 10-year, up about 10 basis points on a two-year. Taking out the move low we saw on the two-year on Friday. Remember that so-called Goldilocks jobs report? I'd still call it that. That had all the flavours of Goldilocks. It came in a bit softer in terms of what you'd expect from the participation rate, higher. The unemployment rate, higher. Wages a bit softer. Payrolls growth, still nicely robust. That's what you want to see, not just once, but a few more times than that. So the two-year yield came in. I can tell you we've just replaced it with a two-year yield going much higher by 10 basis points on a two-year right now, 348. Coming up, President Biden making a case ahead of midterms. The extreme MAGA Republicans in Congress have chosen to go backwards, full of anger, violence, hate, and division. But together, we can and we must choose a different path. Forward. That conversation up next. These MAGA Republicans in Congress are coming for your Social Security. The extreme MAGA Republicans in Congress have chosen to go backwards full of anger, violence, hate, and division. But together, we can and we must choose a different path. Forward. A future of unity, of hope, of optimism. We're going to choose to build a better America. The President of the United States there. A few fiery speeches, addresses from him over the last week or so. Joining us now is Anne-Marie down in D.C. ahead of the midterms. Things pick up here, AMH. What are you looking for? Yeah, the president is certainly ramping up his criticism of the Republican Party ahead of the midterm elections. Jonathan, of course, there was that speech in Pennsylvania last Thursday. But just yesterday, he went not only back to Pennsylvania, but also to Wisconsin. You heard some of the attacks there. He is going after what he calls MAGA Republicans, saying they want to unwind some of the legislation the Democrats were able to get through, as well, like prescription drugs, lowering the price of those for Medicare users, as well as clawing back on social security. He took aim in Wisconsin's particularly at Senator Ron Johnson. And of course, the Democrat facing off for that seat, Mandela Barnes, is actually leading in the polls right now. But interestingly enough, something of a little bit of a habit we've seen from some of these Democrats in some of these very competitive races. Uh, the nominee, the Democratic nominee, Mr. Barnes, did not show up alongside President Biden because re what Republicans are doing is really making this a referendum on the economy and the Biden administration. Administration. But what the Democratic Party is really trying to do is tie these Republicans to President, the former President Donald Trump and these ultra MAGA, as they would call it, uh, legislation and policies that they want to push through. Anne-Marie, have we clarified what an ultra MAGA 
extremist, actually, is when 74 million people voted for the former president. Has he clarified that since that speech last week? I think the president, when he uses it, just wants to encapsulate a far right part of the Republican Party that show fealty to the former president, but doesn't exactly go through what, quote, ultra MAGA might mean in terms of policy stances. One thing he does bring up, and he did yesterday, was he tied uh, Senator Ron Johnson to what he had said about the January 6th insurrection and him saying that it was by and far largely peaceful. These are the types of comments that President Biden and other Democrats in these competitive states are really going to harness and go after. Amory, good to have you back. Welcome back. AMH down in DC. Heard a little rumor also that Maria Tadeo might make a comeback later this week as well. Be good to see her too. On the S&P 500 right now, we turn negative on the S&P, down almost a tenth of 1%. On the Nasdaq 100, down about two tenths of 1%. Went through the bond market price action a few times this morning. I'll get back to that for you. The two-year still high by nine basis points. The 10-year up by 12 basis points, just short of 331 right now at 330.91. Some economic data out just moments ago. Mike McKee has it for you. Hey, Mike. John, we started this morning with some uh, gloom about the overall global economy, and we get some numbers that support that gloom from S&P Global. Their PMIs for services and for composite come out worse than expected. Their drops, the services PMI drops to 43.7 from 44.1, and the composite 44.6 from 45. Now, S&P has been running below the ISM numbers for pretty much all of the last couple of months. We do get the ISM services number at the top of the hour. 56.7 was last month. The forecast is for 55.3. The ISM number, uh, manufacturing number came in with no change last month, but the underlying numbers were good. We'll see if ISM has better news for the markets than the uh, global PMIs. Mike, we've covered this a few times. Can you explain to all of us why we have seen that massive gap between the S&P global PMI and the ISM index, whether it's manufacturing or services? Sometimes we see this, a big undershoot from S&P global and then a really robust ISM. What do you make of that? Well, S&P has a, a, a broader uh, business subset than the ISM numbers. The ISM is basically the biggest com companies in the United States, and also S&P has a lot of export business, and uh, the export business is not good right now. Mike McKee, thank you. Breaking down the data. Mike's going to break down the ISM, I believe, at the top of the hour. Guy Johnson, Alex Steele and the team. Looking forward to that. About 20 minutes into the session, we're negative a tenth of 1% on the S&P. We're down about a quarter of 1% on the Nasdaq. The data doesn't help. Let's see if the ISM confirms. This bond market move won't help either. Up 11 basis points on a 10-year to 3.30. On a two-year, up nine basis points to about 3.48. Breaking it down for you, get you some sector price action now. We could do that with Abby. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, that's exactly right. I think that those rising bond yields, that's really pressing into stocks because, of course, as you know, in the pre-market, stock futures had been sharply higher. Now we're a little a bit lower. If we break it down sector-wise at this point, not surprisingly, we have a flip from the open. Most sectors are lower on bottom. Communication services will be digging into that deeper in just a moment. Also, consumer discretionary, so some of those mega cap tech stocks. Interestingly, financials down at this point, even with yields higher. I think what really stands out the most, though, John, we have these defensive sectors, utilities, uh, health care, and even real estate. Real estate's not defensive, but it's another yield-sensitive sector. So even though those uh, stocks typically will decline when yields are higher because the dividends are less attractive. That's not the case today. Investors are going into defense. Now, if we really break down the weakness here, uh, it is coming from some of the big cap tech names, but in China, the likes of Alibaba and other big cap tech tech stocks in China uh, are sharply lower, uh, including, as I was just mentioning, Alibaba and JD.com. That's dragging, of course, on the Golden Dragon Index down 1.5 percent. And we also have, take a look at that Nicey Bank Index, that's down about 1 percent, really underperforming the Nasdaq 100, which is down about three-tenths of 1 percent, again, having to do with that weakness in China. Abby, thank you. Some interesting moves in foreign exchange as well. Europe has just got the worst of all worlds right now, exposed to the China story that Abby's talking about more lockdowns and very exposed to the energy story as well. Euro dollar breaking down by a third of 1%. Right now, 98.94. You've got to go all the way back to October 2002 to see a euro. This week, looking at sterling, sterling breaking down, almost unchanged on a session right now, 115.35. Positive about a tenth of 1%, but it was through 116 a few hours ago. And now it's having another look at 114. Lower the session yesterday, 114.44. You've got to go all the way back 
to the 80s to see sterling that week. That's some of the FX price action. Equities, as I say, rolling over down two tenths on the S&P and the Nasdaq down four tenths of one percent. Coming up, the market moving events you need to be watching. That'll be next in our trading diary. Live from New York City, this is Bloomberg. Surprise. Nobody uh, should be surprised by uh, this very last decision of the Russian government. We need to be prepared for a total cut of gas supply from Russia. And we have been preparing that kind of uh, decision with President Macron, with uh, many other member states, over the last weeks and the last month. So we must be prepared, which means reducing our gas consumption. This is the first thing to do. Then diversifying our supply chains, that's exactly what we are doing now. And also trying to build for the future new energy production thanks to uh, renewable energies and nuclear energy. So don't be surprised, we all expected that kind of decisions and we will be prepared. And the decision yesterday by the G7 to impose a price cap on Russian oil, how much do you think this is going to reduce the oil income, the income for Russia? Uh, I think that the purpose is uh, really to reduce oil revenues for Russia, because we don't want to put sanctions against Russia, and on the other side, to have Russia benefiting of uh, revenues uh, from oil or from gas. So the idea of capping the price of oil is, I think, the right one. And the fact that the G7 decided to move on that direction is really very good news. Then there remains uh, three points that must be fixed over the next uh, weeks. Uh, the first one uh, is, of course, to get the unanimity of the 27 member states of the EU, because if you want to change the rules of the six package, you need the unanimity of the 27 member states. And let's be clear, um, it's not, you cannot take that for granted. The second point is the outreach. We need to convince other partners outside the G7 to join that initiative, because we don't want that G7 initiative to be a Western initiative against uh, Russia. We want this uh, capping of oil price to be a global initiative against war in Ukraine. That's totally different. And the third point is uh, a technical point, but a quite important one, which is how to define the level of price that uh, might be uh, required. It's a difficult moment in Europe, that's for sure. From New York, here's your trading diary. Top of the hour, ISM services. The Fed's beige book and a Bank of Canada rate decision on Wednesday. Plenty of Fed speak through the week. We get an ECB decision Thursday, followed by President Lagarde's news conference. And you'll hear from Chairman Powell in that news conference at the same time, just in different places on different things. From New York City, that does it for me. Equities rolling over the euro, rolling over as well. From New York City, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.